Hey everyone, it's been a long time, but today I'm bringing you back a classic Q&A video. We have many unique questions lined up, so if you have any of your own or want to see more Q&As, leave your feedback down below and let's get started. You spoke a lot about chest expanders slash strand pulling. However, it's unclear. Do overhead pull-aparts target the lats well? No. Expander pull-aparts are terrible for lats, and if you rely on them, you might end up looking like a yoked thumb. This is because all you're doing is protracting and retracting your scapula with straight arms, and then opening up laterally, which recruits the rear and side delts. When people talk about upper back thickness, they are primarily referring to the traps, which are huge if you examine an anatomy chart. That's what gives you that three-dimensional pop. The lats are all about width, and the teres major ties into that illusion from the top. But again, you're going to build that from pulling, and the teres work synergistically with the lats, as do the rhomboids and traps. In other words, the expander alone can be argued to be a wrong replacement or a sister. So I'd say someone who does pull-ups and pull-aparts should eventually develop an elite bodybuilder level back. However, you'd need the vertical pull, and this must take priority over horizontal if you already do a lot of pull-aparts. For me, I'll do weighted pull-ups, lap pull-downs, any rowing variation, followed by expander pull-aparts for complete back development. In between sessions, I'll rotate between horizontal and vertical. So the vertical and horizontal pulling volume doesn't have to be equal. And believe it or not, the expander complements horizontal pressing by keeping your shoulders healthy. It's one of the secrets that Louis Simmons noted way back, that 70s powerlifters had fewer shoulder injuries. It's not just about the absolute load, since there were still some raw pressing beasts. It was about having massive rear delts and strong traps that lock into that retracted position. So you never lose tightness and your base remains stable. One final thing, since the expander is a bronze era device, Take a look at those bodybuilders and you'll notice that most weren't that wide unless they had a gymnastics background like Bobby Pandor, in which they'd have been built through doing lots of pull-ups. Even with Fred Rollon, as impressive as he was with his 140 kilogram expanding strength, his lats were comparatively lagging. So for thickness, the expander is a gem. But for width, please do not rely on it. What do you think about training seven days a week, one set per muscle group to failure? For example, one pull variation, one push, one squat, one hinge, and do it every day and maybe rotate exercise every week. Interesting. Well, you wouldn't accumulate enough volume even though it's a very high frequency approach and you're hitting all the important movement patterns. The major drawback lies in your idea of doing only one set. Not to mention that there's zero isolation work, which is a guaranteed way of creating real long-term muscular imbalances. So based on your math, it's essentially an infinite compound movement push-pull leg split. This would mean two to two and a half sets per muscle group per week, which is far below all volume recommendations. It's kind of a weird Bulgarian light heavy duty hybrid. So the only way I can see this working is if you combine the horizontal and vertical movements alongside squat and hinge exercise within the same session. This way, you'd at least double the volume to four to four and a half sets per week, which would be at the very bottom of hypertrophy guidelines and could work if you were hitting true failure. Then you can do one set for an isolation exercise or two. For example, on your push day, you could do one set of bench press, one set of OHP, and then one set of push downs with an optional mechanical drop set for extensions. On your pull day, you could do one set of weighted pull-ups, one set of bent over rows, and one set of inclined curls. On your leg day, you could do one set of barbell squats, one set of good mornings, and one set of quad and or hamstring isolation work. You could also add auxiliary work like pull-aparts, calf raises, flies, etc. on whatever day seems fitting for you. In addition, having a second pairing of exercises can help reduce overuse and bias different areas while still hitting the same muscles and fundamental motions. Finally, if I misinterpreted your question and you're suggesting doing all these exercises in a full body style done seven days a week, then I'd say this would never work because you specified training to failure. Now, if you were working within two to three reps in reserve, then I'd say you're in the clear, though I still wouldn't recommend a full body routine every day. Doing it five times a week with two random rest days is good enough and will account for any programming flaws because recovery is quite important here. So. That's how you could program low volume full body for all situations. You said you don't warm up for a deep press after benching since it's similar movement patterns. Do you do the same for good morning after barbell squatting? 100% yes. And I started doing this a couple months ago. The only reason why I didn't sooner is that I was afraid of straining my lower back or hamstrings. However, after trying out, which is what you always do, get in the trenches, I realized there was little difference. So if I'm squatting four plates for reps, 
I'll literally remove a plate and go right into my 315 plus work set for reps. The truth is your back was already actually preloaded with much heavier weight such that good mornings essentially feel like a drop set. It's not as heavy on your back and the spinal erectors are fine since you're isometrically contracting with less load. So the intensity evens out. No hamstring pulls either, even though squats don't work the hamstrings. So maybe the stabilization aspect plays a role? I can't explain that one, but all I know is that I don't feel injury prone, which is significant as I'm generally careful with my hinges. And if using the reverse safety squat bar where I'm squatting three plates, it'll be the same pattern when I switch to two plate SSB good mornings. The only time I will thoroughly warm up on good mornings is if it's my first exercise, which is valid if you have a more hinge focused leg day and will solely do belt squats immediately after to traction out the spine after the axial loading, which is always a nice combo. Other than that, if you're skilled at good mornings and your barbell squat was noticeably heavier, then you don't need to warm up. And for those who are scared, drop down one plate and rebuild. Starting with empty bar, despite overloading, is mostly psychological reassurance. Just saying. I'm 64 kilos in body weight, could deadlift 200 kilos, squat 180 kilos at 19 years of age, but my bench is only 95 kilos. I have tried everything, but does not seem to go up. Any recommendations on what to do? I have been weightlifting for two years now. First of all, you have excellent pound for pound strength across the big three lifts. Weighing in at only 64 kilos, which is 141 pounds, and achieving starting intermediate numbers is impressive. Also, you accomplish this within a reasonable two year time frame while still being a teenager. So there's no doubt that you have even more untapped potential. With that in mind, the reason for your plateau couldn't be more obvious. You've chosen to remain in the second lowest weight class in powerlifting, being only seven kilos heavier. Unless you're extremely short, there's no way you'll reach elite numbers while staying at your current weight. And your plateau serves as proof of that. Therefore, it's time to embark on your first bulk because I know for a fact that you're close to being shredded. Now I'm not suggesting you get fluffy, but expecting your bench press, which is the most weight dependent lift to skyrocket while staying at this extremely light body weight is asking for trouble. Also, your squat is only 20 kilograms less than your deadlift, indicating that you actually have the build of a bencher. That means your bench press should be higher than what it currently is, despite being an amazing achievement for your body weight. So I estimate that each increase in weight class would result in a proportional 0.5 plate increase per side on your bench. Meaning you should aim to surpass two plates at 69 kilos, reach two and a half plates at 76 kilos and achieve three plates at 84 kilos. I have high expectations for you based on your relative strength and the fact that you met the required base standards within two years. So your next three years should be very productive provided you don't shy away from gaining weight. Lastly, move away from basic linear novice progression and consider following a proven intermediate system that incorporates some form of periodization. This will be a game changer for you. You don't need specific benching advice like, what's my weakness? I'm slow off the chest. No, all you have to do, and this applies to anyone who is underweight, is focus on refining the fundamentals, particularly being in a calorie surplus and optimizing your general programming. That's it. This vague combination is what will elevate you to the next level. Good luck. Is it valid in your opinion, three to five minutes between compounds and one to two minutes between isolation work? Should this always be used? Well, this is particularly valid for compounds, but I would not suggest low rest intervals for isolation work, even though it's traditional. Two to three minutes is likely a better bet, as you'll lift heavier and experience less of a performance drop off on subsequent sets while not needing as much volume, especially for arms. This idea that they must be painfully burning for metabolic fatigue gains doesn't really hold up in 2023. It all comes down to mechanical tension. And even with blood flow restriction training, it's about inducing a state of fatigue such that the high threshold motor units can be recruited faster and with less load. So without hard intensity, which is the trigger, your arms could be hot and balloon near the point of amputation, but hypertrophy will not occur or be optimized if the effective reps aren't accumulated. And it turns out that many small muscles aren't actually small on an individual scale and don't necessarily recover faster. In fact, it could be argued the opposite. Therefore, your isolation work should feature enough rest. This way you don't need higher volume. Why do six sets of 10 bicep curls with a minute of rest when you could do half with two to three minutes max of rest? Also, in terms of saving time, this is what supersets are for. And for that, 
you will not notice a drop off in performance, particularly for isolations. The only lifters who should use a minute of rest are those who don't grind on isolations, which to me is a mistake since the body can handle it. It's not a conventional deadlift. Don't worry about stimulus to fatigue. Or two, if the joints hurt and limited rest allows for pain-free added tonnage. Other than that, compounds and isolations should feature similar rest, maybe one minute apart tops, depending on the exercise, which you should always feel out based on how they tax you. So you're only doing six sets of compounds and four sets of isolation, right? And that's twice a week? That's a lot less than I expected. That's exactly right. And as of today, it's officially been an entire year of me training this way. I've documented everything, and there are many full workouts for you to check out on Instagram at alexleanitisofficial. Nine out of 10 times, I do six sets of compound movements and four sets of isolations. And I pull this off by not doing three compounds with three sets or one isolation of four sets. No, I just evenly divide this total volume by doing two sets per exercise. This way, I get more angles in while reducing overuse. And by the end of the week, everything was targeted. And because I train very hard, usually to zero reps in reserve, this volume is plenty. It's 12 sets a week for the compounds and six sets a week for the isolations. So you really have two choices. Either go up in the 15 to 20 set range, but train less hard and probably lower your rest intervals or choose the more efficient, brutal route, which is what I've gravitated to. I train this way to get stage ready. And when rebounding out, I hit my biggest and strongest day yet in the 180s. Just to say, last year I did a 242 times one AD press in the 190s. This year, I did 245 times two while being 10 to 15 pounds lighter. I also benched 315 times 10 at 181 and took my decline dumbbell extensions from 40 pounds all the way up to 60 pounds and hit 17.2 inch cold arms between 181 and 185 at only five foot five. Talk about a lot of numbers anyway. Yes, it works really well and you don't need as much volume as you think. Maybe the isolations can be pushed slightly more, but with what I'm recommending, this is still more than enough to get you elite gains. So take my experience as you will. All I know is that I'm not going back to three sets of this and three sets of that for a very long time. I'd rather do fewer sets with more exercises. Speaking of which, you can learn more about this philosophy in this comprehensive video. I only wish I knew about this sooner. The longer you cut, the more muscle mass you can lose. So how long should one cut? That depends on how much fat you wanna lose and what your starting body fat percentage is. If you're over 30%, you can die down to 20% in a relatively short time frame and probably not lose any muscle. However, going from 20% down to 10% might take you three to five months. And let's say that with every minus 3% drop, performance drop off <laughs> becomes noticeable, and that's when you may start to appear smaller in muscular measurements and clothing. If you then attempt to get extremely lean, you can't sustain the cut for an extended period because you become highly susceptible to muscle loss. Each passing week becomes like a ticking time bomb. So I'll say this, unless you're obese, most cuts shouldn't last longer than six months. And within that time frame, I'd highly recommend a one month diet break to reduce diet fatigue, making it easier to reach your final goal. Now, if you're aiming for maximum aesthetics and are only slightly above your desired body fat, say 15 to 20% being a reasonable range, then a straight three to four month moderate cut will suffice. And I'd suggest stopping right before you reach a shredded to the bone condition is ideal. In my experience, that means being truly eight weeks out in a competitive bodybuilding context. At this point, you'll still have good work capacity, decent relative strength, plenty of vascularity, and some striations here and there, all without feeling like you're on the brink of death. So aim to be photo shoot ready, not competition ready, which doesn't take as long and is far easier to maintain. The free hoodie sale with Barbell Apparel is extended. Get a free stealth hoodie with any order over $99. Normally an $88 value, these premium hoodies are built to handle your toughest workouts. With a sculpted athletic fit, moisture wicking, and odor resistant fabric, it's one of my favorite pieces of clothing to throw on for those early morning training sessions. Barbell Apparel has sold out hoodies every year, so be sure to grab yours before they're gone and join Barbell's community of athletes who make no excuses and sell for nothing less than the best. Backed by a 365 day no questions asked guarantee, this training gear and casual wear is built to power whatever your workouts, work days, and adventures demand. Check my link in the description box. What's the best body fat to maximize weighted dips? I see elites who range from shredded to decently lean to even fluffy like Matthew's lat. It's very individual. But what I would say is that shredded dippers are usually former heavyweights who cut down, 
only to reveal a more impressive pound for pound dip. However, as you rightly pointed out, the best of the best are usually slightly fluffy, like Matthew Zlat, Tonio Zeidler, and the enhanced world, Andrei Smaev. What you'll find is that the shredded dippers don't have a total dip that's higher than the fluffy dippers. It can be close and arguably more impressive if there are more plates hanging off, but don't let that create an illusion regarding their absolute strength. For example, the first time I dipped 225, I weighed 181, which is a total of 406 pounds. The second time was 225 at 165, which is only a total of 390 pounds. Then the third time was 230 at 178, which is 408. And then the fourth time was 250 pounds at 185, which is 435 pounds. So as you can see, there's a 45 pound total difference, AKA whole plate between my lowest and best dip. Yet the body weight difference is half of that. So you can be the judge as to what's most impressive. In my experience, being right above 15% body fat is the sweet spot. You don't wanna to be too fat or else relative strength takes a big dip and it can be harder to coordinate. You also don't wanna to be too shredded because recovery is compromised since you have less protection, particularly in the vulnerable way to stretch. You don't wanna strain a shoulder or pec, which is more likely at single digit. Being decently lean to decently fluffy it's comparable enough, but the fluffy edge just gives you better leverages for dips, similar to bench press. However, for pull-ups, you'll find that being leaner is superior, probably because body fat doesn't give you anything for vertical pulling, just extra dead weight. But the cushioning around the joints and intramuscular fat does play a role for pressing, which explains what we naturally see in the street lifting world. Hey Alex, do you think one arm pull-ups with finger assist could help to unlock one arm pull-up? Yes, in fact, that was my primary assistance lift, not the more popular banded one arm pull up. Once I achieved a body weight weighted pull up, I started doing three fingers, two fingers, and one finger for low to moderate reps. Then I mixed in negatives and isometrics with a small amount of archer pull ups. Then I lost 20 pounds of fat and boom, I was instantly able to do one arm pull ups. I haven't lost the ability since and I've only improved over the years. Last year, I did five one arm pull ups. This year, I did five fat grip one arm pull ups and eight regular one arm pull ups. What assisted me was actually super wide grip pull-ups of all things and getting much stronger at all ring pull-up variations. Nowadays, since I know how to do the exercise, if I want to get stronger at one arm pull-ups, I just hammer the volume in with ring archer pull-ups and improve my one arm max through all means. You don't need to be overly specific if you have the ability to do at least one one arm pull-up. The plus ones come much easier after that, which many would assume is the opposite. But yes, finger assisted was my primary tool back in the day. Just remove until you don't need them anymore. Common sense. Hey Alex, when I squat, one of my feet slide over, making my stance slightly uneven. I was told I had weak hamstrings, but I'm not sure what to do. I don't see how this could be a hamstring issue, and many elite powerlifters have lagging hamstrings despite having monstrous squats. And I'm talking 600 to 700 pounds. So if anything, the issue is related to your hips or setting the bar unevenly on your back without proper tightness, which is extremely common. Now there's many ways to fix this, but the absolute best is by doing pin squats. Why? Well, it will quite literally force you to even out your stance, because if you don't, the plates will bounce off the pins on one side, making you do a Steinborn squat, AKA loading the frick out of your obliques. So to avoid hurting yourself, which will happen if you're not even, you'll be very mindful of technique by lowering under control and keeping the hips open while tightening the entire back, making sure you set it dead in the middle and even in the bottom, when the bar hits the straps, you stay tight. So I'll say this, most bilateral imbalances can and will be fixed through bilateral work. It's just that strict execution was not present from day one and false movement patterns were developed but that can be corrected with specific variations that automatically include a reference point and tactile coaching. This is exactly what pin squats will do for you. Only then, if you supplement Bulgarian split squats, will there be legit improvements. Because if you have muscular imbalance, it'll be reinforced with this full range of motion exercise that's been proven to help with pelvic tilt, or if one leg is generally weaker, which could be the case for you, I don't know. So prioritize both to be foolproof, and you should be good within one to three months. Is decline dumbbell extension comfortable because I see the elbows not aligning too well with gravity. With free weights, it's the best you're gonna get in terms of alignment. Obviously, there are still some lateral forces at play, 
but they're drastically reduced compared to traditional barbell skull crushers, where the elbows are locked into place even if you try to somewhat flare. Dumbbells alone allow for more rotational freedom, and the decline allows you to keep the elbows up high and back without forcing that position. Plus, the lockout is stacked in a way where there's still some tension on the triceps, so it's very joint friendly. And realistically, the only lifters who might have some problems are elites that have gone up to repping over 55 pounds. And to be honest, this is where I finally started feeling it. At 60 pounds, my elbows did not feel bulletproof anymore, which is already more than enough and impressive for a guy who has hypermobile elbows. And this is with strict form. So my main solution moving forward is to do higher reps with less weight and an even more controlled tempo. Or you can use cables, which allow the force to go perfectly through the elbow. Though I don't do this because it's a pain in the ass to set up, especially at home. And there's no way I'm gonna train each arm independently unless the pain is so unbearable that I have no other choice. So yes, the alignment is great, but not optimal for every situation. Hey Alex, I was wondering if I incorporate bent over rows before my lower day when I hit RDLs, will it really have a significant impact on my strength? That depends on how big the gap is between your bent over rows and RDLs. If you're rowing two plates but doing RDLs with three plates, then yes, that might be a real issue since your spinal rectus probably receive intense isometric stimulus. There's a 90 pound difference which will bottleneck the actual hinge itself. Keep in mind that the glutes are the primary mover, so bent over rows and RDLs are similar in weight, then that means they're a weakness and the spinal rectors are working overtime. Now, if you're doing RDLs with four plates, then 225 might not be an issue, but hey, you never know. In my opinion, that's a heavy ass row regardless. And it's really those who can hinge between four and a half to five plates that won't be limited by the lower back if they're using regular rowing form or including minor cheating. If the bent over row is done Dr. Mike style where you're not heaving it, the negative is controlled, the stretch is maximized in the bottom and the plates are skinning the ground where you maybe even stand on some mats, then I don't see this exercise hurting most lifters lower days. It solves the blending issue by forcing a massive reduction in load. Let me say it bluntly. 135 is good weight here if you do it right. In that case, what's 135 compared to 315 or 405? Nothing. So you shouldn't feel sore the next day. But if somehow you still are, well, the final solution is to just train your lower body the day before your upper body. Why not lower upper instead of upper lower? That's a clever way to not hurt your squats or deads. Though now, the bent over row itself might be compromised since your spinal rectors were fully stimulated. Here, you almost have no choice but to do it strict style because if you're overloading, you'll definitely feel the lack of recovery and it'll bleed into the following lower body day since there's now one less day for the spinal rectors to recover from. Unless, of course, it's the last workout of the week. But then that means you're only doing bent over rows once a week if you're gonna follow this template. So it's a bit nuanced here, but regardless, you got options. And I can't tell you exactly what you need to do. There will be individualization based on your leverages, lower back strength, and hinging strength. Last question, why not 15 degree incline bench angle? And then someone replied, because the arches. Yes, that's the main reason. Since for most lifters, a 15 degree incline is too shallow and still mid chest biased. When you factor in a small arch with scapular retraction, it's comparable to flat benching. And the tighter you are, the more this is exaggerated. Plus, you have to factor in your individual bill. That's why there's so much debate about what's better, 30 or 45 degrees. Now, in my opinion, 30 is the sweet spot, but for some, it might still be too much. Just analyze how elevated your sternum is in proximity to your chin. It should be noticeably lower. Forget about your bench, look at your body positioning. Be honest, does this look like an incline bench? Like I remember a popular influencer who repped 275 from auto reps on the incline, but struggled with three plates off flat. How'd that happen? Well, he had the most disgusting arch I'd ever seen on an incline bench, and the comment section was quick to point this out. So his 30 degree incline bench became even less than 15 degrees. You'd be surprised how common this is. A guy like this would need at least a 45 degree incline. Likewise, someone with a smaller structure who maintains a 100% flat back with zero retraction, just letting the scaps naturally move, might actually prefer a 15 degree incline bench, even more so than the 30. And for him, it could be a ton of upper chest. So I'll just simplify my answer like this. The more you arch, the higher your incline angle must be. A minor arch, you're likely perfect with 30 degrees. An aggressive arch, 45 degrees. And for contortionists, possibly 60 degrees. But I really don't think this applies to 99% of you. So stick to the 30 to 45 range to be safe, just to not be front delt dominant. 
and I'm very certain that your shelf will pop out soon. With that said, we are done this Q&A. I hope you enjoyed it because I sure did after all this time not doing one. So if you wanna see more or if you have any questions, post them down below and I'll either turn them into shorts or include them in a long data Q&A video just like this. But don't expect it to be a weekly series. It might be every one to three months or longer, depending on the occasion and interest. So make your questions count and I'll talk to you guys next time.